Well, thank you so much. Um, my name is Nicole. I'm a graduate student in Global Studies, and I come to graduate school by way of many years working with uh, youth and communities in arts education in Chicago. And so I know as TAs or as instructors here in the college level, we're often looking for ways to encourage engagement and participation with our students. And I would like to propose and believe that we can look to arts ed education uh, for some best practices and ways to um, think about this, um, to think about that pedagogy as ways we might activate our college level teaching. And I'd like to address this today in our brief time together in two ways. <laughs> One, through our own pedagogical approaches and to the way that we design our activities and our methodological approaches. So I'd like to invite you to take a look at this quote by education philosopher Maxine Green and just take a moment to read it silently to yourself. Notice it deeply, what stands out to you? Are there connections you can make between this and your own teaching practice? Does it raise any questions for you? All right, now turn to somebody sitting near you and just in 30 seconds, share what your first reflections are and listen to one another. Go ahead. Thanks for jumping in. As you're talking with your partner, are you noticing connections between what you're sharing and are you noticing any patterns emerging and sort of the things that are feeling relevant to you? Be interested. Okay, great. Thanks for jumping into that. Wherever you are is fine. Let's wrap up for a moment. And if I could have your attention again. Thank you. All right, I'm curious, are there any pairs who are willing to share something that you shared in your dyads? Anybody willing to jump in? Please, thank you. Uh, I would like to say that when you're teaching a class, it's, uh, it's not just like you're writing, you're passing out information. Uh -huh. It should be treated more as a performance where you're trying to entertain them and so that they're engaged in what you are saying and they are not bored. So Beautiful. That way they would be able to like, retain. Thank you. That's great. Does anything in what he was saying resonate in terms of what you were talking about? Raise your hand if it did. Anything, any connections? I'm seeing nodding. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm putting you on the spot a lot. Great. So what we just did there was um, a, an exercise I'm sure many of you have used before called Think, Pair, Share. And we're going to come back to the structure of that in a moment. But I want to also talk about what I did there in terms of the way that I asked questions of you um, as you were doing that activity. Um, the questions that I asked were guided by um, what are called the capacities for imaginative learning. Um, this is a series of capacities that were developed by Lincoln Center Education and their arts education program out of New York. Um, they have a whole pedagogical approach. Um, these serve as a framework for teaching that is inquiry-based and student-centered. And this framework asks us not only to think about teaching in terms of imparting information to our students, but also to design educational experiences that are pushing the capacities of students as thinkers and as agents. So, for example, if we want to look here in the corner at living with ambiguity, of course this is something that we want our students to be doing because we want them to be approaching material, understanding that there's nuance, understanding that there are multiple perspectives in the way that we can look at and, and approach material, right? Um, so, you know, these, if we're teaching to that capacity and we're keeping that in mind in the way that we instruct, then we're not just asking them to remember the fact, but we're building their skills in terms of the way that they are approaching. And it's up to us as facilitators to build the capacity to do this. So I've pulled out four that I think might be particularly helpful to us here at UCSB, though I think all of the capacities are really fantastic and I encourage you to go back if you're interested in looking more at them. The first is questioning to ask questions throughout your explorations of text, lectures, materials that further your own learning, to ask questions and wonder what if, to make connections, to connect between what you notice in what you're reading and learning, to your own prior experiences and knowledge, to the experiences of others in the community, 
um, and to allow those connections to evolve throughout um, a course. Creating meaning. So for this, it's creating your own interpretations based on what you're learning. See these in lights of others in your community and creating a synthesis and then being able to express that in your own voice. And then reflecting and assessing. This one's really important because it's asking students to reflect on their learning, to identify what they've gathered so far, what questions still remain. And this is something that we should be thinking about peppering through our lesson plans as not something that just happens at the end of the quarter, but happens throughout. Because really, reflection is the opening of something new and when new learning can happen. Um, OK, so that all sounds great pedagogically, but what does this actually look like in practice? So again, returning to my time as an arts educator, I think there are some tools that might be helpful, which I'd like to share. The first is creating a safe space. So for me, I call this developing a learning community. And I think it's up to us as facilitators um, to create that space for our students. Um, and that means often balancing structure also with, um, and expectations, with a certain amount of vulnerability and availability to our students. So I always start on day one, um, and I say in building our learning community, I invite students to share something about themselves. And this can be as much or as little as they want, a factoid. What did you do over spring break if you can't think of anything else? Right, so that you have a sense of who's sitting around the table and it's not just a bunch of strangers who then you're asking to talk about big ideas together. Um, I also ask us to set intentions, so I say, what are you willing to bring to our learning community together for the next 10 weeks? Um, that might be something like empathy or willingness to listen, or maybe it's a skill set or a perspective that you uniquely bring to the table. Um, I also ask them, ask them what they want to get out of the class, because then I am able to situate and think about the way I'm facilitating to meet their needs and making it student-centered, and it shows that I'm showing up for them as well. And of course, I also participate, because modeling my own participation and engagement uh, will then allow students to be more excited to jump in and meet me there as well. And then as facilitators, appreciating the richness of difference and experience that your students bring into the room and making space for that to shine as well. All right, the second is scaffolding learning. So I would like to invite us to rethink participation entirely as we think about how we scaffold our lesson plans. So we have to be teaching to different learning styles. Not every student feels great about jumping in and talking really loudly all the time. So how do you engage the student who's quieter or a little bit more reserved? And part of that comes in how we design our activities. So going back to the think, pair, share we just did, What's great about this very simple activity is that for students who are shyer, they reflect first, then they share in pairs, which can feel a lot safer, and then they've already done the work that makes sharing outward to the rest of the room so much easier to, to do. And maybe they never want to do that, but you as a facilitator can track what's happening in these smaller groups and understanding those students are still participating, even though they're not the most extroverted students. Um, the other thing about scaffolding learning is designing activities that unfold. So how do you create an activity that doesn't just begin and end, but throughout the course of your, of your lesson plan is deepening learning as you go? So activities that build on one another. So for example, I can share this week in the class I was teaching, uh, students are getting ready, ready to write their midterm papers. So I reviewed with them the writing structure and what we're looking for in terms of you know, the basics, thesis, body of paragraphs, conclusion, what good writing looks like. Um, and then the students broke up into groups, and we divided the five weeks of the course material up. Each group took a week, and then they had to together create a two-minute presentation about that week of material in the structure of writing. So they had to have a thesis, they had to have a couple of backup points, and they had to show a conclusion. So they were practicing that structure before they got to go home and write their papers. Then we were workshopping in the space together some theses and ideas. We were able as a, a group to critique those and think, OK, this is how we might add to that, or that sounds good for this reason. And then that also doubled as a review session. So students were then reviewing and covering all of the material from the quarter up until this point. So that's an example of scaffolding the learning and layering it so that you're serving more than one purpose at a time. I also really like to offer carrots, things that you sort of like dangle out at the top and then maybe return to at the end that are just kind of like lovely ways to, to build student engagement, like a quote, for example. OK, the third is facilitating inquiry-based learning. So ask getting students to be excited about driving their own curiosities in how they learn. And guided questions, the way that we facilitate, is what allows this to happen. So returning to the capacities again, 
this changes the way that we ask questions. So instead of saying, well, what did you get out of this chapter? Or what was important about this reading? We say things like, what connections might we make between these two texts? Or between this author's perspective and the topic from lecture? Or between this lecture and current events? Or something from your own lives? Are there patterns that are emerging across the weeks of study that we're doing? What do you infer from this? Why does this matter? What are the implications? How might we apply this outside of the classroom? Um, did this remind you of anything? So the way that we change question, the way that we change how we ask questions um, really matters because uh, that is what will promote student participation and student inquiry. And then fourth, activities. So not just the way we ask questions, but the specific activities we make so, and build and create. And this is where you can be creative and play to your strengths or what do you think would be fun and exciting. But also getting away from just talking in class and how one of the capacities is embodying. So how do you get students maybe out of their chairs for a moment or writing things on the board and participating in other ways that really activate learning. So I gave you one example, something I just happened to have done this week. Here are a few other things that I really um, have worked really well for me here as a TA at UCSB. Rotating ideas mapping. So you have, if you have a classroom that has multiple boards around the room, students can work in groups. They have concepts on each board. They map out their ideas and then they rotate. By the end of the class, you have generated so much material collectively and then individual students can share out some of these areas. Or you can have expert groups that report out if they take notes at the end, you can um, compile those notes and email them back to the students and they've essentially generated their own study guides. Um, let's see, what else? Doing a writing lab where students maybe bring in a piece of writing and then do some um, peer reviewing around the material. Again, student-centered, student-driven. Trivia games, students work in teams to answer questions as part of midterm prep. It's really fun and then you can pause and say, well, back up that answer and then you can use that to you know, scaffold further a conversation. Um, live debates where students are uh, exploring two sides of an argument. Multimedia, um, which we just talked about, which is such a, a powerful way of getting a conversation going or asking students themselves to bring something in, something related to the text, or at the very least, what's your favorite quote from what you read this week? You have to bring it in. Or please bring in something that confused you or something that you're curious to ex explore more. And then the conversation is starting from students and not from you. So these are some of the, the strategies, I think, both in terms of our framing and also in terms of our crafting and building uh, lesson plans that I hope are helpful to make us think a little bit about the way we shift our approach to asking questions and engaging our students in a participatory way. So I'm going to leave you with another Maxine Green quote about thinking about our, our teaching as opening up possibilities um, and about creating spaces for students to work together and search together. Um, to be more, more awake and active through their learning. And I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Thank you so much, if there are any. Yeah. Anyone? Any questions? Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> Hi. I Hi. really enjoyed your last slide with, uh, with different ways to engage students. And you mentioned that you've tried a few. Do you have any yeah. personal favorites that you love that have been really successful in the classroom? Yeah. I mean, all of those that I put up there have worked for me. Um, you know, one of the things I think about, this is a great question, about any of this working, you have to feel out your students in a given, not only class, but also section. So different activities are going to work differently with different groups of students and you want to play to their strengths. Um, that would be the first. So I don't know if there's like one that's worked the best. I thought this one I did this week with the paper, like mirroring the presentations with the paper writing structure was a really uh, great one and they walked away feeling like ready to tackle their papers or at least that they had sort of had a chance to practice those tools. Um, I think the ideas mapping one is so simple. It doesn't ask a lot of them but it gets them out of their chairs. And the very like, you know, process of standing up and having to walk over to another student and collaborate face to face in this way is encouraging participation that's different than us all sitting around a table. So I'm happy to talk to you more. I, I mean, I think they've all worked in different ways and for different material that we're exploring, right? So there's different, you know, whatever the curriculum is, you're going to build activities to reflect that the most effectively. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's very simple. I mean, so I mean, a lot of the cl our classrooms here have multiple blackboards. 
So um, now my mind's going blank of everything I've ever taught. But <laughs> say you have like, say there's four themes, okay? And you're, you're like the theme of history, culture, um, literature, okay? And religion, these are four themes. And you say, all right, you're gonna take the chapter on history, you're gonna take the chapter on culture, religion, whatever I just said. And this group of five, one, two, three, four, five, you tackle that one over here, you five tackle this one over here, you five over here, you five over here. And I'm gonna give you five minutes. And here's another fun teaching strategy. Tell them you're giving them less time than you're actually giving them because that creates a sort of sense of pressure that activates and jump starts the like, excitement of jumping into an activity. So they spend three minutes, they're like, okay. I'm like, oh man, got three minutes, okay. Just time check, three minutes, and they're like writing, you're like, all right, I can see that there's some good conversations happening. I'm gonna give you one more minute, right? <laughs> so then you, so then students are brain dumping stuff, and you're like, okay, fantastic. Wherever you are is fine. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're generating ideas, really great. Let's, but let's rotate now. And then everybody rotates, you move to the next station. And then I would move to the capacity to say, okay, notice what the group before you, notice deeply what, what, was, hap what was already put on the board. What connections can you make? How would you then build off of that? Is there anything missing? Anything you want to expand? And then you give them another five minutes, they rotate. And then usually, I, what I do is the, I have the groups go back to the board they started with. Okay, group one, you're back at board number one. What changed since you first were there? Notice that deeply, what connections and patterns. And then I would love for you to share, you to report back on that board and then I would open it up and say, did they miss anything that anybody else wants to make sure we touch on before we move on from talking about this? So you know, then conversations happening sort of on micro and macro levels, and everyone's kind of involved in that way. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Thank and if you, you have other questions, you can ask her after our last presentation. <laughs>